fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. This is the last of four sermons that I have done on Colossians 1 verses 13 through 23, and we're going to be doing verses 21 through 23 today. We're looking at the real Jesus Christ here, and today especially we're looking at the consequences of following after false teaching, that is, agreeing with it, and following it, and doing what the false teachers say. And so I will pray, and we will get into it. Father, Son, and Spirit, I know your great concern for your church. Lord Jesus, they are straying, and they put themselves in peril by doing so. You've asked me to speak this so they would know, so they would be warned, and so they would turn back, so they would be empowered to have discernment and so that their hearts would be cleansed so that they would not follow after those who sin against you. Holy Spirit, you opened this passage to me in a way I had not seen before. You're always opening the word more and more to me. You're always teaching me. What you have taught me, I will speak in your power. In your name, Lord Jesus, I pray you would make it so. Amen. So I'll read the three verses, and then I'm going to talk to you quite a bit about what verse 23 means, and then we'll get into it more and more as we go along. I'm going to be giving you some examples of what it means to you, what the consequences are of following after false teachers. So I'll speak these three verses, verses 21 through 23 of Colossians 1. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed You continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. As I have said before, the church today is flooded with many false teachings about Jesus Christ. I will not address those false teachings in this message. I have addressed them in past messages, and I will continue to. But this is about what following them means to you. The Spirit-filled Paul was very concerned about the believers at Colossae, for they were following false teaching. They had turned from the true gospel that he had given them. They were accepting this false teaching and heeding it and living as the false teachers told them to live. By abandoning the true gospel through which they had been saved, the believers in Colossae, as I have said before, revealed that they're infants in Christ, the same as Corinth in 1 Corinthians 3.1, that they're unable to discern the true from the false. They were accepting another Jesus and a different gospel. 2 Corinthians 11.4, the same as with Corinth. Therefore, Paul urgently wrote this letter from a Roman prison warning them that they were in danger of moving away from 
literally changing their position regarding their salvation. So they were moving away from their salvation, changing their position from being saved to no longer being saved. I'll show it to you. These were the false teachings they were following. Colossians 2.18, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize, salvation, per Strong's Concordance. By delighting in self-abasement, like self-flagellation, depriving oneself of physical needs, and those sorts of things. Self-abasement and the worship of angels. So they were doing that. Self-flagellation is taking a whip of cords and whipping yourself with it on the back. And the worship of angels. These were the things the false teachers were teaching. And these were the things which the believers at Colossae were starting to follow after. And in Colossians 2:20 20 through 21, Paul says, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Again, by following such things, they were putting themselves in grave danger of changing their position in relation to salvation, of removing themselves from their salvation that they had gained when they believed into Jesus and the gospel that Paul had taught them. The Lord does not want you to do as they did, beloved. And that's why he has asked me to speak this. And you may say to me, what? You're wrong, Pastor Sue. I'm saved, once saved, always saved. So before I teach verses 21 through 23 of Colossians 1, I need to address that because I know that has popped up in the minds and hearts of many who are listening. Already it has popped up. I want to first assure you that I consulted with two very highly respected commentaries, the New International Commentary on the New Testament, and also the Expositor's Bible Commentary. And from the Expositor's Bible Commentary, the commentator says, if the Bible teaches the final perseverance of the saints, it also teaches that the saints are those who finally persevere the ones who stay true to this gospel and to Jesus Christ to the end. Who finally persevere in Christ. Those are the saints. Continuance, he says, is the test of the reality. And from the New International Commentary on the New Testament, what Paul has said in verse 22 that is, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body in order to present you holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. What Paul has said in verse 22 is what they can look forward to provided they remain on the one foundation for faith. Their first enthusiasm for the true gospel was being dimmed. They were in danger of shifting from the fixed ground of Christian hope. Holding fast to that hope, literally the word is faith, is throughout the New Testament an indispensable condition for attaining the goal of full salvation to be revealed at the end of things. So salvation is conditional. In verse 23, if indeed you continue, The following are Bible verses that confirm this. 
Paul to the believers at Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He spoke this to the believers there. 2 Corinthians 6.1, and working together with him, with Jesus Christ. We also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. He is exhorting believers. Second Corinthians 13, 5, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? And Paul to the believers at Galatia says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting, that is turning from him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Galatians 4.19, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. Verse 20, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Galatians 5.4, you have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law, that is, by outward works. You have fallen from grace to the church at Galatia, he says this. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. Literally, roam from the truth. Do not roam from the truth. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, that is his sinful nature to please that, will from the flesh reap corruption, perishing. But the one who sows to the spirit pleases God by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Peter, to all believers, 2 Peter 3.17, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. Hebrews 10, 26 and 27, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries of God. If you fall, you become his adversary again. Jesus Christ, to five of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, and to all believers. Revelation 2, 5, to the church at Ephesus. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. I will remove your lampstand means I will take you from your position of being saved. Revelation 2.16, to the church at Pergamum, therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them, literally, you yourselves. I will make war against you yourselves with the sword of my mouth. That is the word of God. Revelation 2.20 and 23, to the church at Thyatira, But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Verse 23, and I will kill her children, those who follow her, with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Revelation 3, 1 through 5, to the church at Sardis. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, 
but you are dead. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. Verse 5. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Revelation 3.16 and 19 to the church at Laodicea. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit, literally vomit you out of my mouth. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. To vomit out of his mouth means that you are no longer in him. He has spit you out. So these scriptures clearly show that it is possible for you to remove yourself from your position of being saved. That is why Paul wrote this urgent letter appealing to the believers at Colossae and warning them of the consequences of following after this false teaching. And as I have said, false teaching has inundated, infiltrated, and overwhelmed much of today's church, not only in America, but across the globe. That is why the Lord has me teaching this today. So now I will teach from these verses. Again, I will read them. And although, verse 21 of Colossians 1, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. The believers at Colossae were formerly estranged, just like I was and Jeff was. We were separated from God, and we were hateful toward him. We did things that were against God. We hated him. I hated him. I wouldn't even let my mother and father speak to me the words Jesus or God. And I chose to do evil. And these chose to do evil before they were saved. I did evil things. I sinned. My sin nature that I was born with was alive and well, and I followed whatever it caused me to lust after. But then, but then, yet, by the mercies of God, He drew me like he drew you. And you believed, hopefully, into the real Jesus Christ. If you did not believe into the real Jesus Christ from the start, then you are even in greater danger because you are not yet saved until you have come to the real him. Paul quotes from Psalm 14, 2 and 3, and Psalm 53, 1 through 3, in his letter to the church at Rome. In Romans 3, 10 and 12, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless, corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. That's how we're born. Yet, yet. Now, the mercies of God by which he has reconciled us to himself. The mercies of God, beloved, by which he has reconciled us to himself, us who were so far, us who hated him by not doing according to what is right. We were corrupt. We were not righteous, none of us. So despite 
your and my complete lack of righteousness, rightness in the eyes of God, we were reconciled to God through Christ, through his death, through his fleshly body, which hung on that cross, him bearing the punishment we deserved for our sin, for our evilness. So when you first believed into the real Jesus Christ, and I pray that's the one you believed into, the one that's in here, when you first believed, you were reconciled to God. And that made it possible for Jesus Christ to present you before him holy, that is pure, blameless, that is spotless, and beyond reproach, that is unable to be accused. That means as you stand before him as a believer in the real Jesus Christ, he will find you to be not only pure and not only spotless, but there will be absolutely nothing of which he will accuse you. But I tell you the truth, when I first believed, even though the real Jesus Christ was being taught in the church I was attending, when I first believed, I was none of those things. I was not pure. I was not spotless. I was not unable to be accused. Had I stood before him at that point, he would have judged me because I was still sinning against him. I had confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior at age 42. But, hear me now, I believed in the Jesus that was coming from the pulpit, but I also believed in many other things. I was a mixture, and I see it in the church all the time. I was a mixture because I believed in some new age teachings that have very much infiltrated many churches, even very large ones. There's one in California that is that does all kinds of witchcraft to give Christians therapy to resolve issues in their lives. I still believed much false teaching. And so I was in the same perilous position as the believers at Colossae because I had believed in these false things before. And I continued to believe in them, even though I confessed Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. I was in the same perilous position. But then at the age of 45, I obeyed the Lord in what he commands all believers to do. So that we may, may be presented pure and spotless and unable to be accused. I stayed in the city until I was clothed with power from on high. And I waited for the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. His commands from Luke 24, 49 and Acts 1, 4 through 5, beloved. He was faithful to keep his promise. I was filled with the Holy Spirit and all that other stuff went out the window. Hallelujah. I threw it to the moles and the bats. I saw the falseness of it. I saw that I had stood sort of with one foot on one side of the fence and one on the other straddling it. He made me pure and spotless and unable to be accused by him when I stand before him in the day of judgment. My faith is now purely according to the word of God. 
And what is more, because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit now fully indwell me, I have their wisdom fully indwelling me, and the Holy Spirit continues to teach me all things. That's from John 14, 23 and 16, 13. So when I hear false teaching, things contrary to this word, I immediately reject it. That would be the cure for the believers at Colossae. And that is why Paul prayed in verses 9 through 11 for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So there is a condition, if indeed you continue in the faith, verse 23, firmly established and steadfast and not moved away, that is changed from your position, from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, from that faith. Remember that word, hope of the gospel, faith of the gospel, the faith. There is an if. You will be presented pure and spotless and unable to be accused by Jesus Christ in the day of judgment, if you continue, that is, if you remain in the faith. But you cannot remain in the faith when you continue to sin against him. Because you really don't believe you'll suffer anything from that. So in that way, you are in danger. And these are in danger. They are sinning by going after false teachers and throwing away the truth that Paul had taught them. You cannot remain saved if you follow the false teaching that abounds in today's church, beloved. You cannot. You would be like me before the Lord filled me with his spirit, with a real mixture of beliefs that include Jesus. So it's possible for you to remove yourself from your position of being saved. If you are still sinning, and if you are following false teaching. But if you stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high and wait for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, if you're filled with him, you won't have an admixture of things, all kinds of different things that you believe some from the world, and some from the Bible. Then you will be found pure, spotless, and unable to be accused. Beloved, I have to ask you now, if you look at yourself, can you say truthfully that you will be found by him in the day of judgment to be pure and spotless and unable to be accused. If you stay in the city, if you wait for the promise, you will be able to determine whether what you are hearing is true or or false. Your heart will be purified. You will not have any other lover than God. You will love God and God only. You will serve God and God only. Not God's, but the God of the Bible and the Jesus Christ, God the Son of the Bible. You then will remain in the faith. Steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. What good news! Instead of teetering on the edge, of losing your salvation, removing yourself from it, you can be made steadfast, immovable, pure, spotless, unable to be accused when you stand before the Lord in the day of judgment. That is very, very good news. Unfortunately, I have been chided for telling people they need something they don't have. You cannot make yourself pure and spotless 
and unable to be accused. No amount of good works that you do in this world can do that. It requires a cleansing of your heart that happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, you have believed into Christ. You have been saved, but you're wandering off into all these other things that are not of God and setting yourself up to remove yourself. He doesn't remove you. You remove yourself from the position of being saved by following after those things and by continuing to sin against him. When he has given you the way and commanded you to do what he says, stay and wait. If indeed you remain in the faith, you will be pure, spotless, unable to be accused. steadfastly holding on to it, not moved away from it, not removed from it, the hope, the faith of the gospel that you have heard. Now, Paul and others, and he's seeing into the future here, that it has been and will yet be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. Remember what Jesus said in Acts 1, verse 8. And you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Indeed, this gospel has traveled to the ends of the earth and continues to travel. When I say that if you continue to sin, you will not be able to be presented to him pure, spotless, and unable to be accused in the day of judgment. You have to know that Jesus himself says that. No one who sins will enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father will enter. What is the Father's will? It isn't his will for your life. It's his will to give you a pure heart, O oh believer. That's his will for you. He who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. I never ever knew you. All who are following a false Jesus from the beginning, he does not yet know you. Run to this word and find out who he really is entirely. Pray for the Lord to show you the truth in here. He will. Pray for him to fill you with his spirit. He will. Pray for him to save you, the real Jesus Christ to save you. He will. It's all there for you. Glory to God. His kindness, his mercy. He calls out to you, all who call themselves the church today. All who call themselves believers today. And he says, oh, turn from what you're seeing and hearing. It is not of me. Come to me. Come to the real Jesus Christ. So if you continue to sin, it says, away from me, all you who do sin, practice lawlessness. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? That's 722 of Matthew, 723. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice, that is do, lawlessness, that is sin. You who do sin, depart. If you follow teachers who do not Teach the real Jesus Christ, beloved. 
you will not be presented to Jesus Christ. Spotless, pure, and unable to be accused. Why? You have removed yourself from your salvation, from the salvation that he was so happy to give you, from the salvation you began with, but you went this way. You went after false teaching. Sounded good. It's not according to this word. You have followed another Jesus, a different gospel. In doing so, you remove yourself. Repent. That's what he calls the Colossians to do. Repent before the day of judgment comes and you stand before him and he says, I never ever knew you. Again, the believers at Colossae were in a perilous position, just like I was with my Jesus Christ and a mixture of other beliefs, going to church every Sunday and being there every time the doors open. They were in danger, just as I was, of removing ourselves from our position of being saved. And becoming estranged from God. It was through God that we were reconciled. Now we're going after other things. We will lose it. We do it to ourselves. And as you saw, the believers at Colossae do not have spiritual discernment because they go and do these things. They were not filled with the Spirit. That's why Paul prayed for them to be filled. So my question to you is this, beloved, who are you listening to? What is coming from your pulpit? Is it a Jesus who wants to give you your best life now? That's not what he wants to give you at all. He wants first to give you eternal life and second to make it so you can stand firm in that position and not be moved from it. by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Your best life now, that's a me gospel. Almost everything that is taught from pulpits all over. I mean, I have been to churches and I have heard sermons online and such. And they are teaching a Jesus who is there to do stuff for you. He's there to do stuff in you. Big difference. And the stuff he does is awesome. You will stand firm. You will overcome. You will not be fooled by the fools in the pulpits and even leaders of denominations. You will not lose your position. So if you can truly say to me today, yes, I know when I stand before Jesus in the day of judgment, he will find me to be pure and spotless and unable to be accused. If you can say, yes, that is how he will find me, then hallelujah, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. If you say no, then heed his words today. And he will make you steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord and unaccusable. Pure and spotless. Purifying your heart. Acts 15, 9. Peter says his testimony. then you will no longer be in danger, in peril, because of all this false teaching that's floating around everywhere. Following after it. Your sin nature will be crucified. That's the thing that goes after those things. They feel good, warm fuzzies. Oh, that's what we want. What's God going to do for me? He's already done everything he needs to do. Now it's your turn. Amen. You do what you need to do. Obey Jesus. 
stay in wait, be filled with the Spirit, and there will be no problem at all for you to stand firm. You will immediately identify false teachers, and you will not listen to them. Because the one in whom you believe is in you, large and in charge. That is the answer for all believers, and that is why Jesus commanded that for you. He knows what you need. So if you say, no, I know I'm not. I know I'm not. He's going to forgive me anyway. No, that's not what it says. You'll stand and he'll say, I never knew you. Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Who are you following? Is it the real Jesus Christ? I pray so. Lord Jesus, you have asked me to show your church, the one to whom you've sent me, your truth, and to warn them of what will happen, what can happen, that they can remove themselves from the position of being saved by following false teaching and by continuing to sin against you. Oh, Lord, may they see and hear. May they cry out to you, I can't say yes to the question, will you be pure and spotless and unable to be accused? Work something in my heart, oh, Lord. You will answer any who would say that, any who would cry out to you. Let it be so, I pray. Amen. Fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit.